Hello, folks. You're listening to Revenge of the Drive-In, brought to you by the Grandma Sophia's Podcast Network. This is the podcast where we watch and talk about a drive-in double feature consisting of two films randomly selected from a list of over 1,700. Those films this week are Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho from 1960 and the 1986 film Spookies, directed by many, many people, (laughs) none of whom I've heard of. (laughs) <laughs> and um, I'm your host, Patrick, and I'm joined here by... Jim, hello, folks, I'm back. All right, yes, yeah, so yeah, we got we to talk spookies. <laughs> um, we got to talk psycho. You know, I don't want to say this is a common thing where there's like a giant discrepancy in film quality. It's obviously happened before. <laughs> oh, yeah, it has, yeah. Um, but, this, but this might be the greatest quality gap we've had. Oh, yeah, absolutely, I think. Yeah, because, I mean, Godzilla, Picasso, Trigger, like, Godzilla isn't psycho as much as I love it, and Picasso Trigger is a whole lot better than Spookies, let's be perfectly honest. You know what, in in our master ranking, I would put Spookies one spot above uh, Screwballs. Yeah, I'm, Screwballs, or excuse me, Spookies competes for the worst movie we've watched. I think, (laughs) you know, I, I think technically, on a technical level, Killing American Style is the worst film we've done i don't i mean i did that episode Mm -hmm. with sean so i don't know if you've seen that movie that is the worst movie we've done i think on a technical level but it's far more entertaining than spookies ghoulies is far more entertaining than spookies you know all these other like picasso trigger screwballs is it's 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 there with screwballs it really is but to be fair psycho on the short list of best movies we've done i would i dare i say number one i would put it yeah, it's and definitely done, up there. We've done some quality movies. We've done Aliens. We've done Audition. We've done King Kong, you know. But Psycho's great. It's Psycho. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's the great way to put it. It's Psycho. It is what it is. It's a classic, you know. It is a masterpiece for for a long time because Alfred Hitchcock has been my favorite director for for a really long time since I've watched. Probably around the time I watched like Strangers on a Train or so, you know, the fifth or sixth movie I'd seen by him. I'm like, wow, this guy's awesome. You know, hot take, right? (laughs) But pretty much the entire time, Psycho was my favorite movie by him. Now, you know, for for, for years I was was saying that like, okay, Vertigo's better, but I still prefer Psycho. Now, Vertigo I do prefer, but it's just, it's like one or two notches above in my all-time list. These are... Psycho's a top 10 movie for me. Vertigo's a top 10 movie. Yeah, yeah. Psycho is Psycho. And do you have anything to say on it before we get into it? Not really. I guess the only thing is I, I've i seen it a few times before, as as one would with such a uh, Yeah, I've, I've uh, seen it so many times. Yeah. I found that I wasn't as taken in by it, I guess. And I, I think it's because the first time you watch it, you're essentially grewed. Uh, <laughs> grewed, fuck. <laughs> I am grouped to the screen. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. The first time you watch it, you are pretty much glued to the screen. Sure. But once you know the twist, it just becomes a lot less exciting. But okay, you start. Up, I find, anyways, that I start to appreciate the camera work more and the mm-hmm. things that the actors do in the scenes. Yeah, I found myself enjoying this more as just on on a filmic level than I ever have before. I mean, I've always obviously love the movie but the camera's moving around it's it's a really well edited film the obviously the famous shower scene is one of the best Mm -hmm. pieces of film editing in in history not not just for the time for 1960 but just ever you know yeah and you know i will say too if you're not familiar like if you have never seen psycho before what are you doing listening to us you should go watch it before you listen to us i'm not i'm not going to extend that to spookies no, no, like, no, you no. Can't listen to this without seeing Spookies, you, you, you'll, you'll be better off for it. <laughs> yeah, do not watch Spookies. But I think first-time viewers of Psycho might be surprised that Norman Bates is—he's a, a main character, but the story. And I guess the story revolves around him, but it also feels like it doesn't in a way. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the big thing with Psycho, and this is like, um, if I—I I think. I, it's possible I brought this up once or twice, but yeah, we definitely talked about this when we talked about Alien, and we t- talked about we wish we could have seen Alien without knowing about that chestburster scene because yeah, the chestburster scene is so friggin' famous. You know, 
about it before you see the movie. Whereas if you were around in 79 and you see the movie when it's just out, maybe that would have been the most shocking thing ever. Mm -hmm. Psycho is a little bit like that, except it's really the entire movie. You can say the shower scene and some of the some of the cultural significance of the shower scene is kind of lost over time. I I don't want to say it's like the relevance is lost, but kind of the power of that, you know, that Janet Lee is the big star and she gets killed early on in the movie. Some people say it's like 10 minutes in. It's not. It's <laughs> close to halfway. It's probably yeah. a little bit less than halfway through. Yeah, it's like 39 minutes in or something. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say it's over a half hour in. And that, so, but like Janet Lee, obviously, she's really kind of only known for Psycho nowadays and then known for being Jamie Lee Curtis's mother, especially if you're a horror fan, you know, Halloween, Psycho, the connection there. So, like, you watch the movie now and you don't think, oh, my God, this is a huge actress. How did they kill her off so early in the movie? Because that's not shocking. Janet Lee's stardom did not persist. You know, it's not like um, if you watch a movie and John Wayne gets killed off in the first act, you're like, holy shit, because everybody still knows who John Wayne is. Yeah. And so that's kind of lost, unfortunately. And I think also just the the idea of, like, um, the, the, the twist really of being of, like, a the seemingly main character, the seeming main character being killed off relatively early in the film. People have imitated that, and even just in horror, like alone, people will talk about Scream and Drew Barrymore being all over the promotional material for Scream, the trailers, Mm -hmm. the posters, all that stuff. She's kind of the big name in Scream, and she gets killed in the opening scene. A Nightmare on Elm Street, I think, is, is, I mean, just talk about Wes Craven again it's like the opening scene of that is all it it sets it up as Tina is the main character yeah and then because she's the one having the dream but then she gets she's the first killed so I'm sure there are other examples but like hell I guess the the 2021 Suicide Squad movie was kind of like that we we follow this like Suicide Squad team that just gets killed off (laughs) five minutes into the movie and then we pick up with an entirely different team Continuing with your point there, I mean, that trope, I guess, I I guess you could call it, has been done so many times since 1960. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, I get it. Everybody (laughs) who's doing it is either paying homage to Hitchcock or trying to be Hitchcock in their own way. Not to say literally Hitchcock was the first to do it. I'm sure you, you know, I'm sure you can find other examples. There's literally thousands of films that were made before Psycho. Mm-hmm. You know, there's probably something there, but it's not stuff, you know, not stuff that I'm familiar with and certainly nothing that has stood the test of time the way Psycho has. Yeah. Or Spookies and, for that matter. No, or Spookies. And, and spookies also- <laughs> is, is a real, uh, a real trend center in the, yeah, we, we talked, we we watched one movie this week that absolutely changed the fabric of horror films for decades to come and that film yeah. is spookies yeah <laughs> yeah some say spookies uh it was the first uh slasher movie not psycho spookies. yeah <laughs> spookies yeah spookies you know with all its great effects work was well spookies <laughs> i mentioned the suicide squad but spookies seems to be an inspiration for every other dc comic book movies the, the way it's like very clearly two different shit? films oh, woven into <laughs> <laughs> woven together and it's like all these reshoots and stuff like dc is following the spookies model <laughs> oh that's what's wrong with their model they got the spooky well, that, that itself is kind of a dated joke like dc's kind of course corrected haven't they i don't know i don't follow this I, stuff. yeah me neither i uh like apparently they have i, I mean know. shazam was great shazam didn't have these Sh- shazam like didn't shazam. have spookies problems yes i <laughs> And I, I mean, do you want to talk about Spookies problems now, or do you want to wait till we get to Spookies? Let's get to, let's wait to Spookies. Let's okay. let's talk Psycho. The film opens with that brilliant Bernard Herrmann score, really, really energetic, really fast paced, very aggressive strings, and we get this great Saul Bass opening credit sequence with the with the names flying by and all this the kind of the distorted all this like black and white. Obviously, the movie is black and white. But I always really liked this opening credits sequence. But following the opening credits, we pick up in Phoenix, Arizona. It is, I, I wrote down October 11th. It's, December it's 11th, definitely not. Yeah, it's, De- it's December 11th. I wrote down 10-11. It's definitely 12-11. It's 2.43 <laughs> p.m. 
and the camera just is is above the buildings it's just kind of looking at all these buildings and then it just slowly zooms in and then enters this hotel room and right off the bat we get Janet Lee in her white bra, which is, this is like really racy for 1960 already. And then we get shirtless John Gavin, who um, is, <laughs> of course, named, he's a good looking guy, you know, um, I don't, he's a bad actor, but he's a good looking guy. He plays Sam Loomis, of course, horror fans might be more familiar with that name as that's the name of Dr. Loomis, Donald Pleasance in the Halloween series. This is where they got it from, folks. They're not ripping off Spookies. They're ripping off this other movie. (laughs) And Janet Leigh, of course, plays Marion Crane. They are dating. They are seeing each other on on Marion's extended lunch break. And they're talking about they want to get married, but they can't because Sam is in a bunch of debt. He mentions, well, we learn later he he owns a hardware store, but it sounds like he inherited it from his father because he's still paying off his father's debts he's also got an ex-wife to pay off you know with alimony so you know jeez well you know (laughs) and men his his father (laughs) um you know 1960 this type of thing not that it didn't happen in in the real world of course but this is super taboo at least for in a movie you know this is we're pre-sexual revolution we're pre- the death of John F. Kennedy. I just like pointing that out because that was a great moment in American history. Pre nine uh, eleven, really relevant to Psycho. Other than, well, it's pre pre nine eleven though. But I, yeah, no, uh, <laughs> JFK and the film Psycho are both mentioned in Billy Joel's "We Didn't Start the Fire." Yeah, that's the true. The ultimate boomer porn song out there. It's the for <laughs> the Forrest Gump of of um, classic rock. <laughs> the Forrest Gump of classic rock. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I I'll take that. Yeah. Boom, boomers love their we didn't start the fire it's like <laughs> it's 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 a terrible so all he's doing is listing things he's not saying anything <laughs> my mother told me the craziest thing about that song okay I, I guess it's not really necessarily about that song but uh she said that she was dancing to that song in clubs in kingston ontario wearing i guess this ties into uh, into, into psycho wearing uh, a men's dress shirt and bow tie okay. with all of her lady friends who would also wear the same thing when my dad said and this was years ago and my dad was like you didn't tell me that and she goes ah, don your father's just so out of touch with all the cool things isn't he and i'm like is that a cool thing to wear men's was he men's was clothes? we didn't start the fire ever a really cool yeah thing? And i feel like to... even when that came out that that song was made for like 35 year olds you know I know, I know. Yeah, like Billy Joel wasn't get down hip to it with the, the kids. <laughs> no. Anyway, so so Marion heads back to her office. She uh, it's it's some kind of like banking or like loan company thing. She works with Patricia Hitchcock from Strangers on a Train, who's funny in kind of a small role. This is also where we get our Alfred Hitchcock cameo. We get it out of the way really early on. He's just kind of <laughs> outside the the building. He's just standing there. Alfred Hitchcock, because he's famous for his cameos, he always wanted to have the cameo relatively early in the movie, definitely in the first half, because he was known for that, and he didn't want people distracted, like, looking for it during, like, important scenes and stuff, which is probably really really smart. And this is one of the earlier cameos in his movies, at least that I've seen. He's, he's like, the first thing you see in North by Northwest, so because he misses the bus, like, right when the opening credits end. But <laughs> other than that, oh, and I guess the birds, he's, like, one of the first things you see also. But North by Northwest, Psycho, and the birds were three consecutive movies for him. So he was on that really early cameo kick from 1959 to 1963. He beat out Stan Lee by, like, 50 years. I don't know. I don't want to talk shit about Stan Lee, but I don't I I... I've never gotten anything out of the Stan Lee cameos, but I'm also like, I just don't care about Stan Lee. So that's really what it is. Whereas I love Hitchcock and I love his cameos. Some of his are really like genuinely funny too, which I guess maybe some of Stan Lee's are, but like there's, there's a great one in in Lifeboat. And this one was one that I was really curious how they would squeeze Hitchcock in there because the entire movie takes place aboard a boat that like nine or 10 people are on. And they have a newspaper and there's like something about a weight loss drug and it's a before and after picture of Alfred Hitchcock. (laughs) And it's like, oh, that's really creative. That's That's awesome. (laughs) So Marion's boss enters the office with this like 
oil guy uh, you know he's like a texan oil guy I, I don't know if that's what he is he's a rich guy but he's wearing a cowboy hat that's why i say he's a texan oil baron <laughs> because that's just what he feels like i would have guessed but that he's too, he's yeah. he's a little drunk you know and he starts kind of flirting with marion and he just hands her forty thousand dollars and this is forty thousand dollars that's meant as a, the purchasing of a home for his daughter but he just gives it to her in person and Marion's boss says, like, you know, just take that straight to the bank, like, you know, because we'll figure everything out on Monday or whatever, because they're, they're not used to just getting $40,000 in cash. And $40,000 is a lot of money back then. I don't have the um, the inflation stats pulled up on here, but, I mean, $40,000 back then, definitely enough for a house. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, um, my grandparents bought a five-bedroom house in Toronto in 1955 for like $25,000. And that's 25000 Canadian, too. So I know. <laughs> back then, maybe that's... No, I'm not... That's not a joke. It's I know, just I like know. that's that's less money than 55000 U.S. is. That's, that's a fact. Uh, hold on. I, I'm, I'm pulling up this inflation here. All right. I will continue. So Marion asks that, like, hey, after I deposit this to the bank, can I just go right home? I'm not feeling well. And the boss is like, yeah, sure. So she goes to her home, and she starts packing. So she's already decided she's not turning the money into the bank. And then this is the scene, too, where you notice, I pointed out the white bra earlier. Here, she's wearing a black bra. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's a little indicator. Oh, she's turned to the dark side, as it were. <laughs> she's turned to the dark side from that... Roughly three hundred and seventy-one thousand American dollars in today's oh three hundred yeah three hundred well yeah it's enough for a house somewhere I don't know if it's enough for a house in Phoenix nowadays because <laughs> no, Phoenix probably is not, no. so different now than it was in nineteen sixty no one lived back there then but anyways she packs all her stuff she intends to go she never vocalizes this, this obviously but she's very clearly intending to go visit her boyfriend Sam who lives in Fairvale, California. So as she's driving about town, she's stopped at a red light and she sees her boss and her boss does like a double take and then she's thinking, "Oh shit." <laughs> and so that's like the last thing she does when she's still in town. And as she's driving, she's imagining conversations in her head, you know, with her boss saying like, you know, this is you know, Monday the next week, you know, wanting to know where she is. And then it's just like, wait a minute, I actually did see her. And she pulls over late at night and she wakes up to a cop knocking on her window and then talking to her. And he, she's acting super suspicious, obviously. And the cop is really just checking up on her, making sure, making sure everything's okay. But then when the cop takes note of her license plate, then she starts acting even more weird and she goes to buy a new car at, like, the first car dealership she sees. And the cop has <laughs> followed her there and is just watching her from across the street. And I love the scene with the cop, too. Like, how... Because he's got those, like, aviator sunglasses on, right? Mm-hmm. And all the shots of him just talking to her are super close on. And he's just looking at her. And she's, like... And it's, like, intimidating. It's genuinely intimidating. It is, yeah. Imagining yeah. that from her scenario, from her point of view... And he's just, like, you can't see anything in his eyes. Yeah, but I also like that with those aviators on, he looks like he's not he's, he's not taking any bullshit. You know what I mean? He can smell her a mile away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he's, I mean, but then I also love the reverse of her. And she's, like, wide-eyed and, like... Terrified. Not, innocence, innocence, not the right word, but, yeah, terrified, intimidated. And it's just that the back, the back and forth, the way the camera cuts, it's just, like, the, this... It makes you kind of anxious for her. And at this point, she's not a good person, but, like, you know, this is who we're following on this journey. So at the car dealership, she talks with this John John Anderson guy. This is the actor's name. He's in a bunch of Twilight Zone episodes. He is classic car salesman guy. This is, if I'm making a movie in the 50s or early 60s, this is the first guy I turn to for a car salesman or a salesman type. Oh, absolutely. Because he's just, like, the perfect... The way he talks, he's just got this, like... I could maybe see him being, like, a playing, like, a baseball announcer, too. Mm-hmm. You know? Absolutely. But... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's just got this, like, something kind of fun about him, just the way he talks. It's it's great. She So she's trying to buy her car, and she's 
basically trying to go as fast as possible she's like listen i'll trade in my car and i'll buy this one like how how much would you need from me and he's like don't you want to take it for a test drive and she's like no just (laughs) so so i think i think she trades in her car and pays 700 i believe yeah yeah then as she's purchasing the car this is when the cop actually enters the parking lot and at this point she has switched her money out from i mean it's still in an envelope but she's got it within a big newspaper now. So that's where the money is. It was in just this giant envelope before. Now it's in the newspaper. And she leaves in such a hurry when the cop is showing up that she almost leaves without her bags. But the worker who had been checking out her car stops her and gives her her bag. And then she takes off. And now she's got a new conversation to run through in her mind where it's the cop talking to the salesman. And it's like, you know, did she like, it's like, what, what was her deal? Was it like someone chasing her or something? Like, and then the salesman's like, ah, does she look, does she look like the, the wrong person to you? And then the cop's like, well, she acted like one. <laughs> yeah, I like that line. <laughs> and then this is when she's driving. It's late at night. It's raining. So she has to pull over. She finds the Bates Motel and stops there. No one is at the motel at first. So she just honks her car horn and... Norman Bates, Anthony Perkins comes down from the house. So this is the Bates Motel. We've got this, we've got like two buildings or maybe, maybe it's one building, but it's like an L shape. I think it's like two buildings is the motel and it's classic kind of shabby rundown motel. And then you've got this awesome freaking gothic house just kind of up the hill from there. And there's this winding staircase going up that hill. And it's just, it's the coolest house in movie history. Oh yeah. Pretty much. And so Norman meets with her. Norman is super friendly, maybe a little weird, but he's super friendly. And she, when she checks into the hotel, she uses a fake name. She uses the name Marie Samuels, and he asks for her address. And she, and then he clarifies, "Oh, just the town would do." And she's like, "Oh, Los Angeles," because she looks at her newspaper, which is the Los Angeles Times or whatever. So she checks into cabin one and she mentions that she's really hungry. And Norman says, hey, there's a diner just outside of Fairvale. And then she's like, oh, I didn't know I was that close to Fairvale. But since she doesn't want to leave with the rain, he promises to make her a sandwich. This is also that Norman Bates homemaker stuff. This is, (laughs) you know. So as, as he's showing her her room, and there's a great little moment here where he's just like being very specific about everything. And he, I love, I love how he talks about the uh, the stationery with uh, Bates Motel printed on it. If you want to yeah. make your friends back home feel envious, <laughs> I love that line. That's a great one. And then I love when he opens the bathroom and, and turns on the light, and he's like, and he's like over, over there. And then she has to say it for him. He can't bring himself to say the bathroom. And I love that because it's like. You know, because obviously we learn soon enough, we learn like just in a minute here that Norman has this like overbearing mother. And I love that this, this is such like a thing in the movie Carrie or the novel Carrie and Carrie's mom is so like religious and and overbearing and, Mm -hmm. and just crazy. And that like even normal everyday things like, um, anything involving the body is like considered unclean or something. And you kind of get the impression that's what Norman is like, that he was brought up to be proper. And, and, and it's also probably he's intimidated that it's a woman and a beautiful woman at that. Mm -hmm. Also, what kind of a dinner is that sandwiches and milk? I mean, you know, a lot of people drink warm milk before going to bed. I guess, uh, you know, then I was thinking, I don't, I I was watching it and I was like, you know who else had sandwiches and milk before bed? fucking bing crosby in white christmas and he also shared sandwiches and milk with a lady in that movie and he also murdered two yeah. people in that movie. yeah, yeah he also killed her in a shower <laughs> who's the better murderer <laughs> bing crosby's you know father issues are to be believed he was a bit of a monster you take that back at least that... at least one because he had two different sets as kids one yeah. i think the 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 older set said he was like a horrible person and the, the younger set said, oh, he was great. So, hey, who's to believe? Yeah, though, exactly. Though he uh, he died like a boss on a golf course in the 70s. I think his last words were... Just like Carl Weathers. Did you really? Well, no, I mean, in Happy Gilmore. Does oh, he yeah. By an alligator or something? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, no Carl Weathers is still alive. No, Bing Crosby's last words were something like, um, that was a great round, fellas. 
Let's head to the clubhouse for a drink. And then he had a massive heart attack and died on the 18th green. <laughs> and then, then Bing Crosby's real last words were, why I wouldn't even harm a fly. <laughs> <laughs> That's the joke of the day right there. <laughs> so Norman heads upstairs and he's because he, or his, he heads up to his house because he wants to have her over for dinner. And he gets in a very loud argument, and it has to be very loud because she, Marion, can hear it from her motel room that she, he's yelling back and forth with, with his mother, and his mother doesn't want to invite this young, pretty woman over to the house. Even though Norman seems perfectly innocent about it, like he just seems like he's trying to be friendly. So he eventually comes back down with sandwiches and milk. And she apologizes because she feels like she has <laughs> given him a bunch of trouble. And he's like, no, 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 it's fine, you know. They eventually sit down in the parlor to eat. And this this parlor, of course, is filled with stuffed birds. Because, uh, it, I mean, it comes up really early on in this conversation that Norman, not really into birds, but he's into taxidermy. He's into stuffing things. That's his hobby. We learn soon enough, it's, he doesn't really have other hobbies. It's, he doesn't have friends because he has the famous line, a boy's best friend is his mother, which is, you know, great stuff. And I just, I love this scene. <laughs> I love this entire scene of dialogue between the two of them. It's so friggin' awesome. This is probably my favorite scene of dialogue in any movie. You said in an episode we did, I don't remember if it was a commentary track or uh, just a random episode... Check out our Patreon for those commentary tracks, folks. But you said that Perkins does a really good job at playing creepy and, and like, deranged. I don't remember ever talking about Anthony Perkins in any of our previous episodes really? or commentary tracks. Be really? Because a cycle came up somewhere and you said that he does a really okay. good job at playing, like, like both this kind of well-meaning sort of thing, but deranged at the same time, oh, like okay. like quietly insane. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think um, maybe it was maybe with like Hatch for the Honeymoon because that has some psycho similarities maybe, or maybe with um, no probably with Betsy Palmer in the original Friday the Thirteenth because she kind of has that where she seems like sweet and motherly but then just flips a switch and she's you know crazy mode. But that's where you really start to see that in this scene, especially when oh yeah um, when the the um, when his mother this invalid yes, yeah. is brought up yeah the mother <laughs> is brought up and he mentions that she's sick but then he clarifies oh she's not like ill he he's like it's she's just and he's implying that like she's senile or some kind of like a little yeah. a little kooky a little crazy and then marion be trying to be you know nice and friendly mentions like well you know have you maybe you should take her someplace and that's where that shift really is Mm -hmm. This is, and then he, he starts, you mean an institution, a madhouse? And he goes on and on. And what I love about this scene too, there's so many things. A, Anthony Perkins nails it. And especially because he he doesn't stay in creepy mode. It's not Friday the 13th where, where Betsy Palmer starts friendly, goes creepy, and then she's killing people. Like he, he comes back from it so well and casually and he kind of plays it off well. Like, like he's like, oh, kind of like you know realizing he went a little too far and is trying to trying to like be more himself if you will but but also what i love about it is janet lee's reactions are so spot on yes yeah. she her reactions because this is shot mostly in like a shot reverse shot kind of style we don't get too many shots of the two of them together you know her like her subtle facial reactions when when he starts getting kind of weird she like backs her head a bit like backs moves a little further away and her eyes get kind of more fixated and you can tell she's disturbed by it but yeah, she, she, she just plays that so well yeah and she's even put down her food which she was kind of nibbling at yeah but now she's not touching it she's not even moving she's just kind of wide-eyed and and listening to this psychopath <laughs> He's a weirdo. We don't know psychopath at this point. Yeah, I mean, right, you're the right. You know the title of the movie, obviously. But. <laughs> I also like how uh, when there was that shift in mood for for Norman, the camera was mm -hmm. almost put on the floor, and it was uh, this, yeah. the shot looking upwards. And, th that's and something it's else great the... framing, too, because you get that creepy, like, owl yeah. <laughs> kind of in the <laughs> yeah, background, like, its over wings. him. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's an owl, right? Yeah, There's a bunch is, of yeah. different birds. I think this one is an owl. 
Yeah, and I also think this is where like the black and white is really useful in setting the mood, setting the tone. Yeah, the lighting um, is perfect. This has a very noir type feel. I wouldn't by any means call this film a film noir, but it kind of mm-hmm. has that look to it. Yeah, in, in yeah. scenes, and this one especially, this one most note noteworthy Lee. That's not a word. <laughs> I'll allow it, Mister English PhD. There's also a bit as well where oh, I forget where it is, but again, it's this like use of of this harsh like underlighting where mm-hmm. Norman's acting all sweet and innocent, and then as soon as Marion leaves, uh, he turns and this harsh underlighting hits him from the chin, and he just looks absolutely terrifying. And I think, mm-hmm. like, I was watching and thinking, like, this is great. You know, this is really setting <laughs> this terrifying tone. And I can understand how people were made uncomfortable by this character in 1960. 100%. Because it is subtle, too. The I, mm-hmm. I mean, everything about this movie or about this character until the ending scene, which we'll get to, obviously, is very subtle. It's really creepy, but your mind is able to kind of do a lot of the work for you because when he mentions because this is the scene where he mentions that his mom kind of started losing it after you know she got a boyfriend or a lover or whatever and then when he died and then he even he says something like and even the way he died but he doesn't elaborate on it but you're thinking oh my god yeah was he murdered did he kill himself like yeah oh man it's so great and I love the dialogue, like uh, the dialogue in this entire scene. Like we mentioned, that the, there's the there's two really famous lines in this one, and there's the obviously the boy's best a boy's best friend is his mother, and then the other one, the one that I is like one of my favorite film lines in history is when he this is when he's starting to kind of realize that he went a little too far in his you know talking about his mother, and then he starts like, he leans back and starts being more casual and he's like well you know she she just goes a little mad sometimes we all go a little mad sometimes <laughs> yeah and that was a great delivery also too as as weird as this entire thing is this little speech that he's given has convinced marion to go back and turn herself in or you know d- d- turn the money back in because she kind of realizes like she says, like, uh, referencing something he said, she realizes, like, oh, you know, I stepped into one of my private little traps and I need to get myself out of it. Mm-hmm. And it, as she's saying goodnight to him, she she mentions that she's got a long drive tomorrow morning back to Phoenix. Well, and he also, she also says, you know, because when he says in goodnight, miss, and then she says crane. And then when she leaves, he goes back and looks at the little ledger and it says... <laughs> says Marie Samuels from Los Angeles and he yeah. kind of like laughs a little bit <laughs> and then oh man this scene is great too and this this is so this is the first real big transition of the movie because this is the first scene of the entire movie where we are not following Marion Marion is gone we are now following Norman and after 20 30 minutes or so of Janet Lee being constantly on screen. This is such a harsh but like engrossing transition where we're, suddenly we're following him and we are literally following him as he moves around and he starts peeping on her because he picks up this one photo of a bird and and he's got a little peeping hole to look into <laughs> room 1 where he sees yeah. Janet Lee <laughs> taking off her clothes getting ready to shower. And it's just so creepy. And then he like goes up to his house and we're just following him. We're not really sure what he's doing. Like at, at first, okay, oh, he's being creepy, obviously, with the peeping. But then he just goes up, goes back to his home and it's like, okay, you know, maybe he's fought off some of his darker urges. You know, that's kind of what it appears to be for, mm-hmm. for a minute or two. Meanwhile, Marion takes a shower and I want to point out this, of course, and I'm sure people have talked about this, but the movie's called Psycho, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you for eventually answering that. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, um, am I supposed to answer that? Well, it's, it's rhetorical, <laughs> sure, but whatever. Yeah, the movie's called Psycho, right? Okay, it's named after Norman Bates because Norman Bates is a psychopath. No, Marion is the psycho. She steps into a shower before she has turned it on and then turns it on. That water's going to be <laughs> freezing cold. You have to be a psychopath to do that, right? Absolutely. I'm not insane. I, I turn the shower on. I wait till it gets nice and hot and step on in. Yeah, you, you give it a minute. I mean, my, my shower at home is like, oh, I have to give it like six minutes. It takes forever. <laughs> but like, 
I don't know. This is a shabby motel room. There's no way it's got, like, instant heat. Well, also, I also want to point out, she ripped paper up and then flushed it down the toilet as well. And That's I'm like, right. Who, That's important. I'm like, who does that, even? <laughs> Just put it in the well, trash. Well, but technically her paper is incriminating. Yeah, you're right, but I, I don't in, know. In, I said incriminating, like, in, it, like combining incriminating <laughs> and, and intimidating. But no, it's incriminating <laughs> because it's... She, um subtracted 700 from 40,000 40, yeah so i can understand not wanting to leave that in a garbage i guess which also i guess should we also mention i'm sure everybody who talks about psycho mentions this but i guess this is the first first on-screen, on-screen toilet fl- flush yeah but it, i re- i was reading about it earlier and it's apparently in north america so yeah. perhaps they filmed toilets in in the in the uk <laughs> But no, and this is is this is noteworthy too because Hitchcock apparently fought like crazy to make sure this scene was not cut from the movie. And you think like, okay, wait, why is it a big deal? And but Hitchcock was one hundred percent right, and he's like, no, 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 it's essential to the plot. You need to see that she flushes the toilet here, yeah, and tries to get rid of this. And I think that's also kind of why he put it in there. He because Hitchcock was always pushing boundaries for one thing or another, whether it's sex or violence. And I think 100% he just put the, this in here to be like, hey, yeah, I want to show a toilet flush. And like, let's, let's write it in so that it's essential for the movie, <laughs> for the plot. And it worked. By God, he did it. Well, he also fought hard for the shower scene, obviously, and um, for the opening scene of uh, uh Oh, the, the, br- and, the bra? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because for 1960, you see an awful lot of Janet Lee, And then obviously this shower scene that's about to come up, fully naked woman very very clever editing very clever blocking so that we don't really see nudity Mm -hmm. but we come awfully awfully close to seeing it and yeah that's that's i mean we'll just talk about this scene so this is the shower scene a figure in women's clothes pulls the curtain open pulls up a knife and starts stabbing Marion as she screams and screams. And it's th- this is obviously where the music is going really hard. It's just nothing but really high-pitched strings, unforgettable music, obviously. And the scene is so great. It's so perfect. And we have all these edits. And I think it's a, basically a body double the entire time, except for when we see the face and when she's screaming. But I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, there's but, some discrepancy on that. Apparently, yes, th- there's the all actress. sorts of discrepancy on this this scene. I I know there's an entire documentary on just this scene alone because it's arguably the most famous scene in movie history. I mean, it's literally just known as the shower scene. How many other movies? Yeah, just have a name like that. You know, have a scene like that. The crop duster scene in North by Northwest, maybe. What else you got? Uh, the here's Johnny scene. That no one, no one calls it the Here's Johnny scene. No, you're <laughs> right. no one is. I mean, someone has. Well, first of all, the shine. The to be perfectly fair, the best scene, Blood the Shining, is the Blood is elevator. the bathroom scene. Oh, oh yeah, that yeah yeah. That that is easily the best scene of The Shining. What else? Yeah, I mean the, the Boulder scene, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I don't know. There's maybe a few others, but it's the shower scene. That's like, it's, it's like a proper noun, you know. <laughs> And it's so great. Yeah, there, there's some discrepancies. Some people have alleged that Hitchcock wasn't even on set for this, which I think that's been debunked. But, you know, people kind of argued about it for years still. And I think it, stuff like that all goes back to, like, someone wrote something in a book one day. And then, you know, who knows? I don't I haven't done my due diligence on this, so I can't really speak for all this stuff. But I'm assuming body double for most of this, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to look this up quick. But if I'm not mistaken, Janet Lee was actually pregnant with Jamie Lee Curtis when she was shooting this movie. Really? Okay, never mind. No, Jamie Lee Curtis was born in 58. I was mistaken. I thought never she was mind. born in like okay. 60. All right. Well, I'll, I'll give you a bit of trivia. When Janet Lee was in the shower, they got, because they didn't want like any accidental nude shots of the actual female yeah. form, they got like stripper pasties pasties i guess oh yeah sure they got stripper pasties uh and then they cut the tassels (laughs) the welsh uh, welsh pasties (laughs) yeah or cornish excuse me yeah they they, they got they got stripper cheese and (laughs) cheese and onion pasties yeah they got stripper pasties and pasted them onto her boobs cut the tassels off and then i think they had her in a few scenes where like a skin colored 
leotard, but only the bottoms. Okay, sure. And then apparently they also had to cut a scene out of... Because uh, I think Hitchcock said that there were 75 shots in that scene, but on closer inspection, most film scholars, I guess you could call them, count only 60 different shots. Well, yeah, and now when you say shots, I assume you mean like edits, basically, because because if you think of it, there's like probably four or five different camera angles, maybe even a little bit more than that. So it's not like each one of those is necessarily a different shot. It's, it's like um, every edit cuts to something, but it could cut to something that, you know, we've already seen something from that angle, which was technically the same shot, but I guess we're talking edits, basically. I think it's all technically different shots because in every shot there's a different thing going on so it might cut back to like her stomach let's say but in the the first time you yeah there's the great shot of the knife not going into her stomach but like next to her stomach and that's a a really quick cut and that's like when this movie came out people were so convinced of two things that a they actually saw nudity Mm -hmm. i.e nipples and you come very close to seeing it but you don't see it And then B, also that you actually see the knife penetrating the skin, and you obviously don't. Mm -hmm. But just the incredible editing and the quick editing, it convinces you that you do see more than you actually see. Yeah, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre has that kind of thing all over that movie, too. That's another wonderfully edited movie. This scene, uh, this shower scene in particular, you were supposed to see either the stand-in or the actress's bum, but that had to be cut. Okay. Apparently. So that would have brought it up to 61 or perhaps there were well, like how five, many ass five shots different. Do we exactly. Get? Perhaps <laughs> there were five exactly. different ass shots. <laughs> 15. You said 75. Oh, yeah, that's right. 15. Damn it. <laughs> it's like an entire different edit of this scene. It's just a lot more awkward and just. Bring out the Hitchcock edit. <laughs> Release the ass cut. <laughs> Release the ass cut. So anyways, this scene concludes with Marion slumping to the ground, sliding down, reaching her arm out very slowly, very lackadaisically because she's dying. And this woman turns and walks away, never see the face, obviously. And then Marion falls, collapses and falls into the shower curtain and like leans over and falls onto the floor. And then we get a crazy shot, too, of um, it starts on her eye, and it seems like it's just a photograph because it's so freaking still. Mm-hmm. But then very, very slowly, the camera starts moving away, and you realize it's a, it's a shot, and it's so insane. And then, and then you see some, like, water dripping down, and it's such, such a crazy shot. It's so great. And then while this is happening, we hear Norman up at the house yelling at his mother. He's like, what have you done? Oh, my God, there's blood everywhere. And then... Norman comes back down to the bathroom, or to the shower, sees this all, covers his mouth in disgust and fear, and then starts cleaning up. This is really great. He brings out the mop. He pulls the shower curtains out to put the body in there and wrap her up. He cleans the bathroom rather thoroughly, except does not get the one little piece of paper that did not make it down the toilet that says 40000 Mm-hmm. Later on, we learn that he changes the beds once a week. You think he would have just stumbled upon that because he's been in the room later, but whatever, you know, it's a movie. Idiot. And this scene is so long. It's it's really, really detailed in what he d- does. He checks all the drawers. He, you know, after he stuffs Marion into the trunk of her car, he goes back for one last look and then finds the newspaper, the newspaper where she has all the $40,000 or I guess $3,300 or thir- $33,000, excuse me. And, he, and then he picks that up and he puts that in the trunk as well. And then he pushes, well, he he takes the car be out to a swamp. $39,300. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Fuck off. Um, <laughs> listen, I don't have this. I'm not looking at my notes here. Um, but then he <laughs> puts the car in neutral right next to the swamp and then pushes the car in. And I like this scene too, because this is, um, this is a great the car, scene. The car starts sinking, but then it kind of stops and he starts like nervously, like, is he eating something or is he biting his nails? He's doing something. I, I think he's like but popping he, like candy or something, right? Or gum or something. Well, he, later on he's eating, I think it's candy corn. Because I, I looked, it looked like candy corn on the bag with 
a K for candy and a K Gross. for corn. So he it's really like some kind of candy. Candy corn's great. Shut up. <laughs> I don't know how widely available it is in December. <laughs> but hey, you know, it's it's California. They have different seasons there. Maybe they have can- candy corn grows year round in, in uh, <laughs> Fairvale. <laughs> yeah. But then after the car stops a bit, then it finally sinks to the bottom. And I will just say that this last 20 minutes or so from the conversation in the parlor through the shower scene, the famous shower scene, through the cleanup into the car in the swamp, this might be my favorite 20 minute or so, 25 minute, however long it is, just stretch in film history. It's so friggin' good. It's so compelling. Even with the him peeping and all that stuff between the um, conversation and the shower scene, it's so friggin' great. Anthony Perkins knocks it out of the park. Janet Lee knocks it out of the park. Hitchcock, all of Janet Lee's body doubles, everyone's great. Bernard Herrmann, obviously. The music in this entire movie is incredible, but the shower scene's definitely the most memorable. Yeah, I totally agree. It's all uh, it's it's entrancing when you're watching it. it. That's how well it's it's all done. You just cannot take your eyes off of the screen while it's happening. Right. It's the opposite of Spookies, where. I fell asleep watching one night and then I mean I did watch the entire thing but I will get to this in spookies because we've we've talked about you know screams in horror movies I've pointed this out with Mark Patton in Nightmare on Elm Street 2 I've talked about it in some of the Friday the 13th movies we definitely talked about it with Samara Weaving in Ready or Not a great scream in a horror movie is really important Janet Lee obviously probably has the single most famous scream in screen history in this movie when she turns after the curtain has been pulled back Mm -hmm. and then we have the lady at the end of spookies which has one of the worst cinematic screams ever (laughs) i actually like when i fell asleep to the movie i woke up at that ending scene with the zombies because it sounded like a record scratching it just sounds so bad it's just the worst (laughs) yeah sounding scream it's so bad if you notice all the screams in that movie are like dubbed (laughs) did you notice that well, there's so much dubbing in that movie. I don't know. Anyways, so back to Psycho. The movie has again shifted because now we are no longer obviously following Mary and we're not even following Norman at this point. So we meet a couple of new characters. Well, I guess Sam isn't new. We reconnect with Sam and we meet Marion's sister. What's her name? I have it written down somewhere. She's played Lila by Vera Miles. Isn't it? Isn't it Lila? Like Lila, that's right, yeah. She's named after the Oasis song. Um, (laughs) She shows up at Sam's hardware store in Fairvale, introduces herself because they've never met before. Because, again, going back to the Sam-Marion relationship was kind of scandalous. You know, don't introduce me to your parents type thing because they're not married and they're fucking. So, um, But (laughs) Lila says, like, listen just where is Marion? Like, we haven't seen her. I know she's here with you. Where is she? And then he's like, oh, I haven't heard from her either. Like, I, I don't know. Because obviously, and Lila correctly assumes, of course, that Marion was going to come to Fairvale because she was on her way. She almost made it. She's like 15 miles from there, 10 miles or something. And then we meet a new character, a private investigator hired by, I guess, the Texas oil baron because they, they don't want to pre- press criminal charges. They just want the money back. But he is Arbogast is his name, and he has followed Lila to Fairvale, and he introduces himself. And I love how he's introduced. It's like just some kind of weird close-ups, and he's just kind of this. This feels very film noir-ish, like because he's wearing the the hat too. He's yeah, yeah. he's very hard-boiled detective looking, and he's played by Martin <laughs> Balsam, who I've seen in a bunch of stuff. He's in Death Wish Three. He's in The Twilight Zone. He's a good actor, good character actor. He's good here. Again, they're, they're, nobody's pressing charges. They just want to find Marion. They just want to find the money. No one has reported a missing person because so far, you know, they're they're not getting the police involved. Arbogast basically ensures them, like, hey, like, let let me run this thing. You guys don't know what you're doing. I will go investigate. And he goes basically from house to house, or not house to house, I guess, like hotel, bed and breakfast, like all these different places. Yeah. And eventually he finds the Bates Motel. It's like the last place he checks. Well, it literally is the last place he checks because he never leaves. (laughs) He almost almost didn't find it because the light is off. 
And the whole thing with the Bates Motel is it used to be next to the highway, but then the highway got moved. So it is kind of in the middle of nowhere. And Arbogast starts talking with Norman, mentions obviously who they're looking for, shows him a photo. And Norman, he, this is where he's eating candy corn. He's, again, very friendly, but he's he's also a little awkward. And at first he's like, oh, yeah, you know, no, nobody... I've never seen her. No, no one's come by here for weeks. But then he starts contradicting himself in a few things he says, and Arbogast picks up on that. So eventually he's like, oh, yeah, no, no, she was here. And he's like, I'm sorry, I wasn't lying to you. I just have, you know, trouble remembering things. And, and Arbogast seems to buy that. And at this time, yeah. there's obviously not suspecting murder. I don't know what they're suspecting. Later on when um, Sam is talking to Norman, he suspects that, he has like hidden her away and um i think i think right now they they suspect that norman has been paid off to keep quiet about yeah 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 about her being there and then later on they suspect that he's killed her and taken the money and this is again norman being friendly he mentions like hey you know nobody's here i was about to go change the sheets i do that every week whether anyone slept in them or not why don't you come join me is he, back to his like charming self Aubrey gas turns him down but he notices a figure up in the window of Norman's house. And he's like, who is that? And Norman's like, oh, that's just, that's my mother. She's sick. She won't be able to talk to you. But then they they talk a little bit more. And Norman says something. He says something like, like, listen, Marion, she might have fooled me, but she didn't fool my mother, which is Mm -hmm. probably a dumb thing to say, to be fair. (laughs) So Arbogast is convinced the mother did speak with her. But he also knows Norman won't let him speak with her, so he has to go about sneaking his way up there on his own. But before that, he calls and talks to Lila and Sam and says, "Listen, I'm at the Bates Motel. Marion did stay here a few days ago, and she must have talked to Mrs. Bates. So I'm going to go talk to her and see what's up." So he sneaks into the house. He's being all stealthy, like walking up the stairs. And then I love this scene too, with the uh, creepy shot of the door just slightly opening door just moving ever so slightly and then we get that great overhead shot of the woman coming out of that room at the top of the stairs with the knife in hand and then stabbing Arbogast and Arbogast falls down the stairs and in, in what's admittedly a very weird shot um it's it's like a, they did like a green screen thing it's very very odd but he's falling down the stairs he's falling back down the stairs but he's still like on his feet yeah all the way to the bottom <laughs> And then the scene ends really cool. Like, with we get, like, a big, you know, a full stab, like, the arm pulled all the way back. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, and the other thing that was great about that scene is how fast the mother ran out and stabbed him. Like, it was just, it was, just, it was like a split second. You know, I, it's mm-hmm. almost like you weren't even expecting it. So after this, Sam goes out to the Bates Motel. Well, the first Sam and Lila talk, and they decide that one of them needs to stay there in case Arbogast does show up. So Sam goes out to the Bates Motel, doesn't see anybody, and starts honking the horn and yelling out Arbogast's name. Norman, meanwhile, is over at the swamp because he has just been burying Arbogast's body, and he just kind of looks back all sinister-like, and he's like, you know, he's in no rush to help Sam, obviously, but obviously the, the swamp is relatively near the motel because he can hear all that nonsense going on. Sam also sees a figure in the window, an old lady in the window. So Sam and Lila eventually talk to, like, the local sheriff, who's played by the old guy that gets murdered in Turner and Hooch. Apparently he never looked young, because this is like 30 years before Turner and Hooch, and he still looks pretty old here. And they have this long scene of, uh, I guess it's exposition, but they're talking about, like, what's going on. And then at the end of the scene, it's revealed, or towards the end of the scene, that whatever happened Arbogast did not see Arbogast and Sam did not see Norman's mother because Norman's mother is dead and buried and then I love I love the addition of um the cop of the sheriff's wife and he's like she's like yeah I helped Norman pick out the dress she wore periwinkle blue (laughs) (laughs) I kind of love that like little addition It, it gives you like small town sheriff feel you know what I mean yeah this is this is not Phoenix this is small town Turner and Hoot sheriff (laughs) <laughs> with Sam and I almost said Sam and Diane like in cheers with Sam and Lila here so yeah and obviously the sheriff is like listen what you need to forget about like 
the money and just file a missing persons report, get the police involved as soon as possible to figure everything out. So the sheriff, we don't see it, but he mentions the next morning to them that he did go down and talk to Norman and, and he basically didn't get any more information than what Arbogast told them. So then Sam and Lila concoct a plan where they go to the Bates Motel. They're going to be husband and wife, and they're going to try and figure out what's going on. And again, they kind of suspect maybe Norman's being paid off. They don't think murder right off the bat anyways. This this scene's really weird, too, because we've we've seen the other scenes with Norman where at the very least he's uh, he's been friendly. And here he's not not really he's just like not having it but it's also like Sam is being weird and kind of mean and rude and yeah. um Norman checks them into a cabin very far away from cabin 1 but when he's like hey let me help you get your bags and he's like I haven't got any <laughs> and Norman so right off the bat Norman's like okay this is weird he's suspicious Arbogast must have said that she stayed in cabin one or something because they know she stayed in cabin one. Yeah, he did, yeah. Yeah, he's like, I even know what cabin she stayed in. So they have a plan then after they check into the motel and they they unload their non-existent bags in their room that Lila needs to get up to the house to talk to the mother, who I should point out has been moved, I guess. We had that really creepy scene, again, of the overhead shot of norman kind of arguing with his mother and moving her downstairs to the fruit cellar (laughs) that came about that came about after the after sam showed up at the motel looking for arbogast that that's that scene happens then and that's also worth pointing out of course because the the sheriff had been in norman's home most recently you know when the scene that we didn't see Mm -hmm. norman norman let him in and was being perfectly normal i guess so Lila needs to get up to the house, so Sam is going to distract Norman. And Sam goes to Norman's office, starts talking to him, and he's doing all the talking. He even points out, like, isn't it supposed to be the lonely people, like the people who are just out in the middle of nowhere and never see anybody that should do all the talking? And Norman's just like, meh, whatever. Like, (laughs) he just doesn't give a shit. I love it. (laughs) Yeah, and and he um, he plays I don't give a shit really well. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I want you out of here. I'm annoyed with... That's the vibe he's giving off. I'm annoyed Mm -hmm. with you here. Yeah. And Sam is in full-on, like, tough guy mode. Like, he's he thinks he's so cool here. He thinks he's so intimidating, and Norman's really (laughs) just like, yeah, whatever. He reminds me a lot of of Riker from Star Trek for some reason. (laughs) You know? Like, he's just getting loud, and he's, like, leaning on the table. Yeah, that's what he does. He just gets loud and leans on the table and yells. But I like Riker a lot. So Lila sneaks into the house. She's looking all around. She's looking up at uh, the upstairs bedrooms, and she finds basically a little child's room that appears to be untouched since Norman was a little kid. You know, it's got, like, toys and stuff, and it's really weird. And then he also finds the master bedroom where there is a mark in the bed from, like, someone sleeping there. This is obviously a very old mattress if it still leaves a mark like that, but that makes sense. Maybe it's memory what, foam. They didn't have memory <laughs> foam back then. Also, memory foam... It, it bounces back. <laughs> yeah, that's the opposite of memory <laughs> foam. The first time I ever slept in a sleep number bed, I was at uh, an aunt and uncle's house, and I put it on zero just out of curiosity. Like, I'm just curious what would happen. And I had an amazing night's sleep, and I woke up, and I was like, the rest of the bed was above me. I was like Johnny Depp in A Nightmare on Elm Street being like sucked in. <laughs> it was awesome, though. Oh, shit. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Maybe next time I'll try 100. I say that's the first time I slept in a uh, sleep number bed. It, 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 I believe it's the only time. So Norman eventually realizes that this conversation is not you know, going so well, this conversation with Sam, and he's like, because Sam is like, you know, hey, what? <laughs> Sam's still going on about the money, and I love that because Norman at no point knows what anyone's talking about when they're talking about the money, yeah. and that's just kind of <laughs> yeah. great. But he's like, oh, I bet you ex- exactly what you would want to, exactly what you need in your life is to is forty thousand dollars to open up a new motel near that uh, freeway, and he's just thinking like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, <laughs> but okay. eventually he he's he's like, wait a second, where's that girl that you're with, and. So they fight, and Norman knocks him out, and then Norman runs up to the house. While this is happening, because he he checks upstairs first, Lila hides like underneath the stairway, 
and then she's like ready to like go leave but then she notices that downstairs there's a there's a door and so she follows that into the fruit cellar where she finds mrs bates she just sees her from behind in her little rocking chair she grabs her shoulder turns her and then of course it's a spooky skeleton slightly preserved but it's a dead body and then lila screams norman emerges in drag he's he's the one been dressing up as the woman and he's got his knife and he's ready to attack her but sam saves the day by grabbing norman and just kind of there's just a struggle and norman falls or gives up or you know whatever and so it's like yo wow great movie and then we have this really long i mean it's not that long but it seems long the exposition scene with simon oakland the psychiatrist which, you know, we got to talk about this scene because this scene is, is, it's the worst scene in the movie. I 100% know why it's there. People watching this movie in 1960 when it comes out would have been like, what the hell was that? And <laughs> was he like, a gay? They wouldn't have known. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, there's even that one guy who's like, they're like, well, why did he dress up as a woman? And, he's a transvestite. And like, he's a transvestite. Like, and then he's like, not exactly. <laughs> like, so I understand why yeah. the scene's there, but it is rough it is kind of you know it it's very talky it goes on for a long time the psychiatrist is very he's very theatrical mm-hmm. uh, which you know i'll give him credit for that because <laughs> he comes out and he's like i got the whole story but i did not get it from norman i got it from norman's mother and i'm like if you're trying to explain this to like cops and people <laughs> who's you know sister or girlfriend was murdered you probably wouldn't talk in this way but i love that he's doing that he's having he's having fun with it you know it's not too often you get a case like this if you're a psychiatrist right so you're milking it for all that it's worth yeah exactly yeah (laughs) and this is where he explains that years ago norman who had always had a very overprotective mother grew jealous when when mrs bates took on a lover so he eventually killed the two of them when they were in bed together and then because he couldn't deal with that grief with that um with that on his conscience, he started taking on qualities of the mother and believing that he was the mother at times. And he, he mentions he could have conversations with her back and forth. And he says something like, he was never all Norman, but now he is basic. But there are moments where he was definitely all mother. And he mm-hmm. concludes that that's basically what he is now. And then this is when the money comes back too. But they're like, what about the $40,000? And he's just like, ah, it's in the swamp. <laughs> These are crimes of passion, not profit. And I love, love, love that there's still people trying to make this movie about the money. It's not about the money. Stop trying to make the money happen. It's yeah. never going to happen. But what about, it's a shut up. Don't you get it? Yeah, well, and shut then up. obviously Lila, Lila asks, like, and my sister? And he's like, yeah, she's dead. Yeah, he murdered her. Or rather, <laughs> yeah, the you, mother murdered her. Yeah, if you couldn't put her. that together. <laughs> yeah, but well, because the mother apparently got jealous of Norman meeting this pretty young woman and obviously taking an interest in her. And then, well, actually, as as rough as that scene ends, that's not technically the end. And the actual ending, the ending scene is actually amazing. I love this, mm-hmm. where some, uh, some cop enters the office where they're having this discussion and is like, hey, can I give him this? He's feeling chilly. And he's holding up a blanket. And they're like, yeah, sure. And he goes back and you don't see it, the, the, but he goes into the holding cell and and hands Norman the blanket and you just hear this female voice say thank you. And then we and then we are inside this holding cell with Norman bundling himself up with the blanket. And then it's Norman's mother with this her interior monologue where she's talking about like can you believe that they actually think I did this that I was capable of doing this. It was, she's like blaming Norman and not her. <laughs> yeah. And then is that great stuff where there's where a fly lands on his hand and she's like why you know i'm not even going to swat that fly and they'll, they'll, i hope they are i hope they're watching me you know they'll watch me and they'll think well, why she wouldn't even harm a fly and then there's this um the shot of norman's face as he kind of gets this grin there's a really brief kind of fade into his like face with a skull which mm-hmm. is really neat i loved that when i was a kid and then as the end comes up on screen we see the car being pulled out from the swamp with the forty thousand dollars in it. Well, yeah, I mean it's <laughs> that's all wet and so you know. And no. So, Jim, what did you think of Psycho? 
Uh, it's a great movie. I mean, you know, as we said at the beginning, it's a, it's a true classic. It's a it's a cinematic masterpiece from one of the greatest person people to ever wield a camera. The thing I think it suffers from is once you've seen it once or twice. I mean, it, like it, it's still an exciting movie to watch, but once you've seen it once or twice, you know what's coming. You know, if I could somehow that's true watch. of any movie though yeah well except, uh, except like i love re-watching a movie like hot fuzz let's say and that's one of my absolute okay. favorite movies to re-watch i could do it time and time again stuff like lord of the rings stuff like that but psycho the big draw for psycho is the twist the shower scene yeah i understand but i also think you know a great twist ending the best twist endings a la the sixth sense or whatever they make you want to re-watch the movie and i think I think that's what psycho does if if we look at the twist as in not just that janet lee gets killed but the twist as in norman has a split personality and is acting as his mother when he kills people which that's really the twist because we we the entire movie are led to believe that he and his mother are different people Mm -hmm. you you know so if that if you view that as the twist then that makes the conversation scenes all all of his like little lines and kind of subtle hints at it all the more thrilling all the more rewarding i think so i i think that twist makes me want to keep watching the movie i understand the janet lee thing which to be perfectly honest i knew about the shower scene before i ever saw the movie psycho is one of the movies psycho is above all other movies the movie that i would have loved to see knowing absolutely nothing about it you know but i knew about the shower scene i even knew it was chocolate syrup and you know that they use for blood you know i i wish because because you are so into that forty thousand dollars thing and and then just the movie takes a harsh left turn and then the money just isn't important anymore and i wish i could have seen that truly been engrossed by that story and then had the rug pulled out from under me it's like audition you know Mm -hmm. a little bit i mean it's not as extreme as audition it's kind (laughs) of like that well yeah and i mean and uh, you know at the end of the day it's my complaint there or my wish to have to be able to watch psycho with fresh eyes every time is a minor complaint because i don't have any complaints about the movie even some of the acting like you know it, it might not be as good as most of the other actors like uh christ what's what's the fellow's name sam's uh the, the john actor, gavin but, yeah i mean he's not super great but he's definitely the worst yeah, but you forgive him and, and any other, like, fault that an actor has just because how great the rest of the movie is. Yeah, and even the even the acting, I think this is a very well-acted movie. I think Anthony Perkins is just perfect as Norman Bates, just absolutely just spot on, you know, I couldn't imagine it being done better. But I but this past time, re-watching it, I did notice that he, he seems to be an actor that plays off of who he's acting with. Because his mm-hmm. scenes with John Gavin are not nearly as good as his scenes with Martin Balsam, and especially the scene with Janet Lee, which is, you know, the shower scene's a classic. That conversation in the power is my favorite scene. He is so good. And in there you could say Janet Lee's playing off of him, too, because she has the, you know, the facial reactions to his weirdness and everything. But I love how natural he is, natural and awkward, and he is with um, Martin Balsam, where at that point you know he's hiding something, but he's still playing <laughs> yeah. it as cool as he can. And then the scenes the scenes with um, John Gavin, which it's just a couple of them and they're not too long, are just not as good. And, and some of that maybe John Gavin kind of sucks. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with you. And Anthony Perkins is such, when you're done watching the movie, you almost want to see just more shots of him. You know, just more stuff. I don't know. I just wish there was more stuff from that movie. It now it's also funny that they waited till after Hitchcock died to start making sequels. I guess. <laughs> I mean, that's not a coincidence. No, <laughs> that absolutely can't be a not. coincidence. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> well, that that was also like it, that was Universal in the eighties. Joe Bob Briggs has talked about this, where Universal felt like they because this this movie is a Paramount release, but any DVD release or whatever, I watched this movie on Apple Movies or iTunes, whatever the hell it's called now, and um, it has the Universal logo, and then the credits kick in, and it says, Par- oh, like a Paramount release or whatever, and it's just, I th- like, Paramount or Universal just, like, bought the rights to, like, everything Hitchcock a long time ago, maybe, probably after he died. Universal, in the 80s, felt like they, they were kind of jealous because they see all these, like, independent producers and you know nightmare on elm street is new line and they're having success with 
with you know this with freddy and then paramount with friday the 13th and all these other like nobody studios and universal's like well we invented horror and we don't have shit to show for it in there <laughs> so they just like started buying up sequel rights to like everything like the fan the first couple phantasm sequels are universal produced and the, obviously the original phantasm is very very independent and that's when they <laughs> that might even be when they bought psycho but I, I don't think i think they probably already had the rights to hitchcock's movies before that but i just love that kind of fascinating little period in history where universal was just like shit 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 we need a big horror movie what <laughs> what do we do and it's like yeah it's psycho too why not uh, yeah now is is indiana jones universal it's got to be right i think that might be a similar thing to yeah, because I think it was Paramount. Because I think it's, it's, well, it's the Paramount logo because they have like the, all the movies, there's like a mountain or something that yeah, fades the into the Paramount logo or the Paramount logo that fades into something on screen. Yeah, but well, I know there's like a universal, well, the Indiana Jones ride is at Disney. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's owned by Disney now. Well, everything's owned by Disney now. Fuck Disney. Well, anyways, my point was. Uh, <laughs> Our podcast is the... probably owned by Disney. Yeah. Now, no, no. <laughs> oh, no. Didn't read the fine no. print. Oh, no. Sorry, Disney. We love you. No, my point was, remember how when, when we were watching The Mummy for the commentary track like a few months yeah. ago? Pretty sure I was at my parents' house watching it because it's on VHS there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, But it opened with like this fancy universal Mm-hmm. montage of like all of their movies and psycho oh, was yeah. in it and indiana jones was in it and all these great movies and then it and then it kind of like started with the with the mummy okay my favorite of those uh, little montages and i can like still hear the music in my head was on some hitchcock dvd and i i, I haven't owned a lot of hitchcock films on dvd i own a few now but i never did when i was younger i would just like rent them from the library or blockbuster or whatever but on some of the Hitchcock DVD releases, it opens with that a universal montage of everything from Hitchcock movies, and it's freaking incredible. And it's like, I know what like 90% of those things are, but when I was a kid, I'm like, oh, I want to know what that one is. I want to see that movie. I can, yeah. And I remember my Jurassic Park DVD has like probably the exact same one you're talking about with The Mummy, <laughs> where it's just yeah. like all these. There's probably Psycho. There's probably Jaw, Jaws is definitely on there. But yeah, I love Hitchcock. Like I said, Psycho is not quite my favorite movie by him. It's it's definitely not the best. Vertigo is very clearly his best movie. Vertigo is better than almost every movie ever. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you that actually because I. But I've Psycho's ever... kind of the sentimental favorite because it was the first one I saw. I grew up with it. It was one of the early horror movies I saw that I would have gotten into. You know, I saw it as a kid, probably seven or eight. Loved it. Wow. Well, it's funny because I've I've only seen six Hitchcock movies. Uh, Vertigo is definitely one of them, and Vertigo is my favorite of the ones I've seen. But I've seen I've seen more films by Hitchcock than any other director. I've seen probably about thirty or so, which is oh, probably yeah, like I'll half just... his movies. He did a bunch of silent movies that I've never seen. Yeah, I think he no. did fifty or sixty movies. Yeah, probably at least. I recently watched, and by recently I mean last year, Notorious, and I really enjoyed that's, it. That's that's the Biggie Smalls biopic that Hitchcock did. <laughs> You're such an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, yeah, it's the Duran it. Duran music video. But anyways, I like I liked Claude Rains in it. Yeah, Notorious is great. It's um probably not quite in my top ten Hitchcock movies. But, you know, I love uh, Vertigo, North by Northwest, Rear Window, Strangers on a Train, is one of the best plots ever for a movie. I think, and that movie's freaking hilarious too. So many great ones. Psychos. It's it's a strong contender. It's probably his second best film. It's probably barely my second favorite movie by his. It's almost first. But yeah, it's a great movie. It's a masterpiece. There's that, again, that 20, 25-minute stretch of um, Norman and Marion meeting through Norman burying Marion's body in the swamp. That stretch (laughs) there. That is the best 20, 25 minutes I've ever seen on film consecutively. And then it's kind of like everything after that isn't as good. The movie takes a bit of a dip after that. Yeah. And then the movie takes an even bigger dip, I think, after Arbogast is killed. Because then we're dealing with John Gavin, Vera Miles. And like, yeah, Vera Miles is fine, but John Gavin just kind of sucks. And that's, you know, that's, that's my <laughs> complaint agree. there. I agree. Speaking of kind of sucking, let's talk about Spookies, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Do we actually, hang on. Do we even need to talk about Spookies? Can we just no. talk about Psycho for another hour? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, are our fans going to be upset by that? 
Probably not, because Spookies is real shit. Well, hey, you know, Phantasm and Screwballs is one of our more popular episodes, and we hated Screwballs, so I guess we got to give Spookies a shot. The there's first off there's like a there's at first I thought it was a midget, but I guess it's a kid running around in that Phantasm dwarf <laughs> <laughs> dwarf outfit. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, he's in a Halloween costume. Yeah. as something i don't know what he is well uh, there's not much to say first off i guess <laughs> this well, is first, let's let's answer the important question yeah jim is there a plot in Spookies? no no yes no. i agree i agree there is not one well see so here's the way i'm gonna explain i do not this. envy your task here in describing spookies because this <laughs> is kind of just like a what the fuck are we doing kind of well movie. if it makes you feel any better or i don't know how you're gonna feel about this but i'm not gonna try to explain it i'm just gonna say what it is and, <laughs> and then we can talk about parts of it it's a movie that speaks for itself i guess if you say first of all it's on shutter if you're yes. that curious, yeah. If you're that curious, check it out. Joe Bob Briggs hosted it at one point. I don't remember which season it was of The Last Drive-In, or maybe if it was one of the specials. That's probably the far more entertaining way to watch the movie than to just literally watch Spookies. So I'll just, you know, quick plug for Shudder, of course. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly how I watched it, and I like the description on Shudder. It's like, oh, a group of teenagers are out for a party until they come group to a mansion. Group of teenagers and one 75-year-old man. <laughs> Anyways, the weird thing about spookies, so, so they, a group of teenagers and their real estate agent. Into yeah. Your house. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the weird thing about Spookies. Okay, it's essentially two different movies, but it's more like three different movies and a short, <laughs> all put into one quote unquote movie. All the stuff with the <laughs> air quotes teens, because all these teens are played by people who are in their 20s or like one one character said she's 24 and then there's like a 40 year old man uh with yeah. all these young people but that and all the stuff in the house with them and the monsters were all filmed in 84 for a movie okay. called twisted souls now the old creepy man who's a sorcerer and the bride is that stuff what he is? Yeah, that he even calls himself a sorcerer at one okay. point. Okay, well, he's he's doing a very bad like Bela Lugosi accent. He's doing like a uh, yeah, uh, exactly. You know, he's doing yeah, the he's, and stuff. <laughs> he's doing a he's doing a Chekhov on original Star Trek, <laughs> almost. Oh, a little bit, yeah. Nuclear yeah, vessels. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, well, Chekhov gets rid of the W or the V's and puts in W's. Yeah, Lugosi uh, yeah. is the opposite, so a little different, but yeah. But uh, yeah. It, just the same level of terrible yeah so then there's like oh, oh it's worse than Chekhov it's far worse than Chekhov so this guy he's like an old sorcerer and he's got this midget son thing I don't know then there's a kid named Billy he's got a green son yeah yeah he's got a green son uh there's a kid named Billy there's also a bride and there's a cat man who looks like a reject from the most recent cats movie it's like a gypsy cat yeah so, so the cat man yeah <laughs> because he's basically a werewolf but he's a cat <laughs> Right, because he he acts like a werewolf, but he uh, yeah. meows a few and, times. And, and, it's not he, bad makeup. No, but he also he also <laughs> he doesn't have two hands. One of his hands is a cat doesn't hand, have... and then the other one is okay. a is a hook. Did you notice that? Oh, he's like the guy from Enter the Ninja. Then I know, yeah, I know, exactly. I did notice that. <laughs> yeah, he's got a hook for a hand. But anyways, mm -hmm. all Buster that stuff. Bluth over here. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, but all that stuff with the sorcerer and Catman and stuff that was all filmed in '85. So I guess what had happened was they that they had filmed a movie or most of a movie called Twisted Souls and then their studio ran into some legal trouble with the person who was writing the Twisted studio Souls, I think. Studio in quotes, of course. Exactly, a yeah, studio in quotes. <laughs> their mom's house foreclo had to foreclose. <laughs> Yeah, they couldn't film in grandma's basement anymore. So I guess it, it was something like they put that movie on hold. And then in 85, they brought in a new director and writer to film stroke write all of this other stuff that they then just crammed into one movie and called it Sp <laughs> Spookies. Which I will say, it's a good title. It's a misleading title, <laughs> it but it's is, a yeah. good title. It's, the name Spookies sounds like a good time. It does. It sounds yeah. like a ghoulies, like a family-friendly horror movie. Sounds like, like you're going to have fun. You're going to be startled. You know, it's it's a name laugh. like that. Yeah. And this is not a really a family-friendly movie. Not that it's like horrific or intense or anything, but it's not really like a Gremlins, you know? No, it's, it's definitely... Um, not 
I don't know if if you're if you're under fourteen, you probably oh, if you're under twelve, you probably shouldn't be watching it. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing that bad in it. But if you're above baby age, you should not be watching it. <laughs> Any age, you should not be watching it. You should just open your trash can and throw it in, or flush it down the toilet like the forty thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, rip it up. Oh, I forgot to mention that Lila and Sam found what was left of that note in the bathroom when they were investigating Kevin yeah, Warner. I'm yeah. sorry, I missed a crucial plot point. But now we're talking about a movie without a plot. <laughs> and no boy, plot don't you miss that? Don't you miss plot points? Yeah, we haven't even, <laughs> we haven't even gotten into it yet. Don't this you miss great. characters and compelling performances and solid direction, creative camera work, scenes that match? Well, speaking of solid direction, Patrick, you know what all of these directors went on to do after Spookies? Kill themselves? Yeah, literally nothing. Except, except, so like, it was directed, so the first part, with the stuff with all the quote-unquote teens, was directed by Brendan Faulkner and Thomas Doran, or Doran. Oh, God, I'm, I'm picturing this guy as, as a relative of the greatest American writer now. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> terrible. This is a Southern Gothic film, excuse me, I didn't give it enough credit. <laughs> uh then all the other crap stuff was directed by eugenie joseph and written by anne bergand who went under a pseudonym of joseph bergand for whatever reason but anne bergand was a producer on the mask jim carrey oh and i didn't look up any of the actors because they're all terrible people and i'm sure they're out of work well you don't know they're terrible people they're terrible actors we do know that yeah, you're right. Sorry, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, Terrible the, actors. This guy's a great real estate agent, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. But hey, speaking of which, I, I you know, just go back to Psycho for a moment. I did not mention anything about the writer of Psycho, and that is one of my favorite scripts with a big asterisk on it where, you know, it's kind of that, it's got that rough scene towards the end, but overall, love the screenplay. Written by Joseph Stefano, or Stefano, who went on to create the television series The Outer Limits just a few years later. So classic science fiction, you know, kind of horror related, but it's a sci-fi show, sort of Twilight Zone-ish. And he also wrote a, wrote a an episode or two for Star Trek, I believe. Oh, wow, okay. Series. So he was more of a sci-fi guy, I think. Robert Block also. Robert Block, I, I believe it's pronounced Block. It's spelled like B-L-O-C-H, C-H, so you'd think yeah. Blotch. But he also <laughs> wrote an episode for the original Star Trek series. He wrote Cat's Paw, which is like the haunted house Star yes. Trek episode. Yeah, yeah. That is, that's the author of the, that's the written by the guy that wrote the book, Psycho. Well, apparently Psycho, the, the, the novel, was such a big hit, I, I, I think. Like it, it's yes won all kinds and of no. Awards. I'm, I'm, have you seen the film Hitchcock? You probably haven't. It's no. the Anthony Hopkins um helen mirren movie it's not bad it's not really it's not a a true biopic but it's it's okay that that movie kind of depicts hitchcock and the struggles that he endured when making psycho and it's a lot about his relationship with alma revel who is his uh, wife who was apparently very important in most of his films i don't really know much about her though but according to that movie it was basically like the book may have been successful i don't know but when they were making the movie they wanted to be so secretive about the plot that Hitchcock like personally bought as many freaking copies of the book that he could so that no one could read it and know the twist ending. <laughs> oh my god, wow. <laughs> which, which I don't know if that's wow. true, but that's in that movie. And if it is true, that's commitment, you know. Yeah, well, you know what else I I, I read about Hitchcock there? He that he funded the movie out of his own pocket because Paramount didn't want to gamble on Psycho. That is true. Yeah, because he's making a darker movie and stuff. And I think at one point, Psycho was going to be just like an hour long and it was going to be like an episode of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And I think that was because he didn't really have, no one really had confidence in this story. And he's like, okay, maybe. And that's that's why it's black and white is it's for a Hitchcock film at that time. It's very, very cheap compared to his other movies. I mean, he just made North by Northwest, which was probably his biggest budgeted movie. And, you know, it stars Cary Grant. It's got these big action set pieces, all that stuff. So, like, yeah, this is, Psycho was like a cheap indie movie in comparison. A cheap indie movie. Yeah. I speaking, <laughs> speaking of cheap indie movies, let's get back to Spookies. Yeah. So we keep talking about how there's no plot and there really isn't. There's this, I guess just to quickly run through it, there's this boy at the beginning, and like, <laughs> when I explain these, they're all going to be separate, but you have to remember that they're all, <laughs> I can't even describe how it's all interwoven. It's not. No, it isn't. It's just like a series of scenes with noises 
that are people talking put together and it's supposed to create a movie but it does not happen it is literally not a movie lots of people being unable to open doors yeah yeah lots of the cat man closing doors <laughs> that's, that's one of my that's one of my favorite parts okay okay hold on first off there's this loser boy billy whose parents forget it's his 13th birthday he runs out into the woods or maybe meets... they don't we don't really know he just he's like going to a house like he's just like out maybe they were throwing a surprise party and he yeah. just wasn't at home yeah and he was like oh i'm gonna go out and hang out in the woods and eat some snowballs and he meets a creepy guy outside yeah yeah who, who then... gets killed by Catman, i think right so then billy runs into the house there's Cat like man crothers that's what we call him folks Oh yeah, so Billy goes into this giant mansion. There's like a like a like a birthday party table set up for him with a cake and eventually he goes to open a present and it's just a severed head, but it's of the sorcerer, I think, and then Billy runs out of the house of the spookmaster. Yeah, the spookmaster general and uh spookmeister general. <laughs> spookmaster flex. <laughs> Yeah, and then Billy gets killed. He gets scratched up by the cat man and then buried alive in a grave. And that's the end of Billy. So there's also, before I get to the teens, the quote unquote teens, because they're the most, like they're the, they take up the largest chunk of the movie. There's this sorcerer first. And I think he's actually the first character we see. And he's a terrible actor in terrible old age makeup. On this terrible set. I'm not saying Tori, it's passable old age makeup. It's fine. Well, when you're... So I was watching this on Shudder. For a movie like this, it's fine. You're right. For a movie like this, it's fine. And we'll leave it at that. But he's got this whole plan to take people's life force or something and resurrect... I mean, he doesn't have... The movie tries to convince you he has a plan, but he doesn't really have a plan. Yeah. uh, So he he introduces the audience to this woman who's... (laughs) in bridal clothes and in a wedding gown in this coffin and he's like oh i'm gonna bring her back i just gotta kill a few more people and this cat man is purring next to him as he's petting him which is really creepy at one point after some people have been killed uh, actually i don't think anybody's been killed at this point but his bride awakes she she awakes from her slumber oh yeah winona Ryder. She looks yeah. like a blonde yeah. Winona Ryder when yeah. you just cut to her the first time. She looks like, because isn't she blonde in like Beetlejuice or something? I know. No, she's got black hair in Beetlejuice, doesn't she? I don't know. She's blonde in something. But this woman is 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 a beautiful woman. And she wakes up and With says, the worst scream ever. But she wakes up and tells this sorcerer, no, let me die. I don't like you. <laughs> and then and she runs away. And boy, am I with her. And she runs away. And I'm just going to tell you. Well, the this is of- like the last scene of the movie now we're talking about. Yeah, I'm just trying to like knock these. Okay, out, well, listen, no... listen. Let's we can't beat around the bush much longer. Let's talk about the farting zombies. Okay, yeah, the muckmen. These disgusting. They're not muckmen. They're they're they they they're farting zombies. This is as much as I hate this movie and think it's terrible. This scene is comedic gold. I found myself <laughs> laughing so hard at this scene. It's so positively dumb you have the jersey boys guy with his girlfriend or whatever they're like hanging yeah. out in the wine cellar and then these like blob zombies pop out from the ground and they start attacking and there's just farting sound effects for no reason yeah. throughout the entire scene and it's just so <laughs> dumb and i i read on imdb that like that was a decision by like the executive producer who's like, hey, let's have farting sound effects, and everyone else is like, no, that's dumb, but he overruled them. Yeah, that's the thing. It's so bizarre, and it's played completely straight because the farts are just added, obviously, in post-production, so, like, nobody's reacting as if they're fighting fart monsters, but they're just farting. It's so stupid. It's so ridiculous, but also because the actual costumes, the makeup looks actually pretty decent. Yeah, and that that's the thing too about you know Spookies. We 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 really get a combination of good looking monsters and some terrible looking ones. But but like there's some good effects work in this movie, and there's some good makeup, and there's some good spooky Halloween costumes, and then you know there's some awful stuff too. But yeah, these guys are fine. They're they're fine. Oh, now because see, I want to get almost directly into the monsters but give me two seconds and i'll explain to people why there are teens at a at a house with a sorcerer and a bride but yes please explain to me well first off let's talk about Catman real quick he 
appears and disappears throughout the movie. Oh, for fuck's sake, just get to the teens. Okay, the okay, okay, is okay, doing his okay. Thing. Catman's hanging out behind doors. That's all he's doing, and it's ridiculous. Yeah, he's hanging out in the window in one scene. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's just there. So these teens, they're driving. They've come from a party because they got kicked out, and they're looking for another party. And with these teens, as you point out, there's like Jersey Boy and Girlfriend, a guy with a fucking Muppet. Oh, God, yeah. Then a, a, a British lady who's kind of rude, and her emasculine sorry emasculate boyfriend and then there's like 45 year old man dating the real estate 20 year old yeah yeah dating 20 year old woman and they all show up at this house and jersey boy's like hey oh hey this looks like we could have a party here oh hey oh and then they all go in and then they start getting attacked by monsters after their friend gets turned into a witch after they use a ouija board yeah there's a ouija board or ouija board whatever it's called that's that's pretty much the plot in so much as there is a plot well, you know, I'm wondering if the original plot, like, of this Twisted Souls movie was that they accidentally, like, summoned a demon and it went into this chick's body and this demon just wanted to kill everybody in the house, so it started summoning other demons. Probably. I don't know. Yeah, there's there's a very loose kind of Evil Dead setup. Very yeah, well, loose. And then they come upon a room that has, like, satanic stuff in it and a statuette of this demon. But because... This is two different movies mashed together. None of it lines up or adds up or makes any sense. Because then you have like this sorcerer playing chess with a cat man and a midget son, midget blue son, midget green son. He's just a child. He's not a midget. I I don't know. I think in some scenes. He's a kid. He's a a kid in in a Halloween costume. He's just someone painted him green and he's got the little vampire fangs. That's what he is. Oh, you're right. He does. (laughs) He's got those dollar store vampire fangs. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But anyways... The monsters. We already talked about the, the okay. fart men. The zombies, some of them look pretty good. Yeah, some the zombies don't really pop up until the end. And that's that's the scene when the bride's running around. She's being chased. The record is, is being scratched all over the place. <laughs> and what? They're what? Just, they just kind of show up. <laughs> they're, they're not really, they're not set up. They're just like, there's even a scene where she like kicks a skull out of the way or something. Mm-hmm. And then a zombie gets up from beneath the ground and then in the next shot she's on the ground and it's like what how did that happen (laughs) yeah yeah the zombies some of them they look okay but you know they're i don't know what they are where they're from you know well i guess i guess the house does have a giant cemetery and it's in the yard i guess there is that yeah and that is supposed to exist in this movie because the sorcerer has been killing people keeping his like trying to bring his bride back to life sure i guess whatever yeah (laughs) all right so what other monsters do we got we got spider lady spider lady's good she is one that actually looks pretty good and she kills the man with the muppet who's an absolutely terrible character he's a he's shit all the characters are total shit and but especially this guy because he's got a muppet muppet puppet named mook who he talks to and it's like grow the fuck up this guy's like 38 like stop it whatever you're doing just stop and it's not funny. Wouldn't Whoever... it be funny if the 45-year-old man had the puppet? <laughs> oh, my God. That'd be so embarrassing. Because that would have been, like, an attempt to, like, here, let's make him look younger. He's acting like a teen. Teens yeah, have puppets. Yeah, let's put a backwards baseball cap on him and give him a puppet. God, fuck. That would have been so embarrassing. But, yeah, he gets all of his juices sucked out. <laughs> they, like, it's like they made a life-size balloon of this actor and then just took all the air out for when the spider lady attacks him. Yeah, which is great. But the and then we've also got the um, lizard mermaid things. Those the, things the mermaid cool. goblins. <laughs> yeah, whatever that is. The the ghoulies. Yeah. It's it's, ghoulies, it's a very yeah. loose kind of ghoulie looking thing. Um, yeah, the movie implies that there's more than one of them. There isn't. You know, we've, <laughs> we've never seen more than one in a shot, but but the movie yeah. wants you to believe that there's like three or four or yeah, 15 something like of that. them. <laughs> yeah. Those things are cool. They look good. Those are, those are some good puppet. And they look good. I like the way they move, especially that shot of that one crawling under the bed with its tail kind of swinging. I liked that. There's the, there's a really weird monster. The I, I have not labeled as the gloopy bone tail. And that's what kills the mean British woman. You know, like she thinks it's her boyfriend and then it gets close to her. And it's like this gloopy monster that has this bone tail that, chokes her and then throws her on the ground then incinerates her yeah. face or something yeah that's fine that one was all right yeah their friend that got turned into a witch yeah the makeup's pretty all right 
this is very like e- it feels very evil dead influenced like the, the when when a person's possessed by a demon in the evil dead they'll have like the the over the top makeup and talk weird this one has the voice of the sorcerer for some reason which by the way all the voices did you notice <laughs> the voice of the sorcerer and his kid sound like they're talking through like a pvc pipe yeah the sorcerer the sorcerer sounds really weird weird his the line when they when the kid opens up the birthday present, he's like, happy birthday, Billy. He sounds like he's like for, coming from another dimension or something. Yeah. yeah, well, look, I've got a glass here. It's almost like, happy birthday, Billy. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's perfect. <laughs> and then one of the other cool monsters that was in it was the, I, I have it called the White Witch that attacked the bride. Oh, yeah. That was kind of spooky. It looked really stupid, though. Like, it looked the most like a puppet, probably. Oh, was this the, was this the one where you see, like, the puppeteer's arms a lot, too, this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it's this one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, but it was a good one. I liked the way its mouth moved. It That's a good, spooky. like, Halloween haunted house decoration. It really Something is. you'd find at Spirit, you know? That's... Yeah, it is. And that's both a good and a bad thing. <laughs> it's yeah. a good thing for, like, a movie, like, again, like, if I'm if I'm watching a movie called Spookies, I'm expecting things like that. You know, that's kind of what it sounds like. I will say the best spooky though that was in the movie was the exploding Grim Reaper. <laughs> oh, th- this is legitimately a very awesome looking Grim Reaper. He looks scary, and he's a badass. He's got a giant scythe, big red glowing eyes, some fangs, but you can see the cloth. And he's combustible. Like, the mouth doesn't meet. Well, he attacks. So uh, pretty much at the end, there's three people left before they die then the bride starts running around the grim reaper should be the climax by the way he sort of is for like our main characters but then we pick up with the bride for no reason and this grim reaper attacks the real estate agent his girlfriend and jersey boy's girlfriend and real estate agent just tussles with him for a second and then throws him off the roof <laughs> then it, it cuts to like a wide shot of this explosion <laughs> Like this huge yep. explosion going off, which is ridiculous, but it was Great pretty stuff. cool. I don't know. Like, th- this movie's so shit. There's literally nothing to this movie. You know, usually mm-hmm. I would say, if you want to just throw something on and, like, have a few drinks and shoot the shit with a friend, then, like, a movie like this would be good. Yeah. But I, Yeah, the I best even... case scenario, the best, the only circumstance where I would maybe recommend putting spookies on is like in the background of a halloween party where no one is really watching the movie because you get all these different monsters it has the appearance of like a movie you would want to watch around halloween it's just terrible and it's (laughs) and it's not worth watching so like maybe in the the background (laughs) maybe that's like the best case i don't even think i want to sit down with a friend and just talk while we're watching this movie this is is like on in the background and you know you might glance at it every 14 minutes or so yeah that's that's and if you glance my at recommendation it, to you dear listeners in regards to spookies and or if you glance just watch at the it, joe bob version because that's i mean he makes any awful movie a little bit better at least yeah and it's also it feels definitely feels too long for what it is as well you know because again it's just a mashup of scenes and it's like why does it need to be an hour and 30 minutes oh let's talk about our twist ending <laughs> what's our twist ending there's a twist ending there's a, like a cliff oh oh yes or whatever okay because the bride is running away and the bride this is the scene that woke me up because her scream is just the ugliest sounding thing i've ever heard but she's <laughs> being chased by all these zombies <laughs> And, you know, they got a lot of zombies, and I appreciate the space they have to work with. Like, this scene yeah. isn't awful. And then she eventually finds a car, <laughs> and she gets in the car, and she's trying to turn it on. And then some guy comes over. He's like, hey, what are you doing to my car? And then she's like, help me. And then the guy sees all the spookies chasing after her, and he's like, oh, here. <laughs> and then he starts the car up, and they start driving away. And she's like, I'm finally safe or something. And then the guy stops the car and turns over towards her and he's the cat man i mean he wasn't earlier he applied his makeup in between shots and i think he says something like don't you know i always loved you or something so the cat man also had a thing for the spook master's wife i guess after all these years or maybe centuries i don't even know so that's kind of a twist or like a cliffhanger yeah well then ending it's really you know because we love this character so much that we met three minutes ago and we wanted to see her make it <laughs> well, out but alive. Then, but then we also can't forget that then this 
like stone coffin lid flies off and Sp- spookmeister general is there oh, yeah. laughing maniacally with his hands at well stretched. i mean that's just like a spook thing yeah yeah spooky <laughs> Yeah, well, he, he's first of all, he visually, he's kind of reminiscent of the tall man a bit. We should point that out. Yep. I mean, he's just wearing a suit, and he's kind of old. <laughs> I guess that's it. He looks kind of gray. Yeah. And then, I mean, he obviously, he's doing his Bela Lugosi accent thing, which is awful. I'm convinced Bela Lugosi could pull off an American accent better than this guy can pull off a Bela Lugosi accent. I'm just saying that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just, it's a real fucking trash movie it's a pile of garbage is what it is so jim what did you think of spookies it's a real fucking trash movie it's a it's a pile of garbage is what it is yeah it's a (laughs) walking disaster i mean this is an awful movie i i teased earlier in the at the end of the last episode which i recorded that episode a long time ago so i can't remember exactly what i said but i said something about like we're doing Psycho and Spookies. We're doing the greatest horror movie ever made and the worst horror movie ever made. And then I kind of joked like, that's eh, not actually that bad. No, no, it is. I mean, yeah, I'm not it's saying that bad. Spookies is literally the worst horror movie ever. I think it's a little bit better than Halloween Resurrection. I think it's a little bit better than it's probably on the demonic toys level. You know, there's worse movies. There's always going to be worse movies, but Spooky sucks. It yeah, really I... is atrocious. It's it's um. It's embarrassing filmmaking. It's bad <laughs> acting. Um, obviously, you know, no amount of editing could have saved this movie, you know, to, to try and Clearly. make the movie more coherent as one story. It just wasn't going to happen. I think, really, if you get rid of everything other than the fart zombie scene, you've got a great 90-second short film. Absolutely. Really. At the very <laughs> least, you have one Absolutely. incredible scene in this sea of utter diarrhea oh that's, yeah that's, that's that's the best thing i can say about spookies, spookies. Is there's one fantastic <laughs> scene and it's got a fun title and some of the monsters are good yeah yeah that's that's it you know uh, and again i i equated it to screwballs earlier and don't be surprised uh, audience if uh, we do a season two wrap up and this is like the bottom of my list because it really is a big pile of stinking shit well, I've already mentioned that we're eventually doing Slave Girls from Beyond Infinity, so get that list ready, Jim, because <laughs> you may be surprised. <laughs> That's coming up at some point. <laughs> yeah, so, um, Jim, which of these two movies do you prefer? Are you Team Psycho or Team Spookies? Hashtag Team Spookies all the way, baby. Uh, no, obviously not. I'm not an idiot. Uh, Psycho is <laughs> well, <laughs> by far one of the greatest things ever captured on film. And honestly, even if Psycho were mediocre, it's that's already ten times the film Spookies is. Hundred times. If yeah, Psycho <laughs> were nothing but a one man show starring John Gavin, it's better than Spookies. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we we both agree Psycho is the superior film to Spookies. So Jim, how do you think this works as a drive in double feature? It doesn't work at all, just because Spookies is so terrible. That's it. You you can't put like a, a a diamond next to shit and have that go together. You know, it's just impossible. How about you? I was trying to think like, could this because Psycho is so good? Could this work if we just put on Psycho really really late and you fall asleep when Spookies ter- comes on? <laughs> but then I'm like, no, it doesn't work because it wakes you up because that because that that is my experience with the movie. I tried to sleep during Spookies and I could not. It woke me up. <laughs> spookies pulled me back in just when i think i'm out they pull me back in yeah yeah i i'm agreeing with you not a great double feature or not not even a good one watch psycho on its own spookies didn't have a script that's a problem or rather (laughs) spookies had two two scripts scripts or maybe three i don't know i mean they're both all of them are awful together they don't work so yeah bad double feature i've got to agree and that hurts to say because psycho is just that good but spookies is just that bad maybe psycho's too good for a double feature i mean it's it's just pair it with any other freaking movie we've watched psycho and picasso (laughs) trigger i'm recommending this as a great double feature you know (laughs) psycho and ghoulies psycho and killing american style all that stuff all right so 
Here's what we're doing next week. I'm joined by a special guest named Kevin, and we will be talking about a couple of 1955 sci-fi horror monster movies in the British classic The Quatermass Experiment and Ed Wood's schlock classic Bride of the Monster starring Bela Lugosi and Tor Johnson. So that's what's up next week. Be sure to join us. Feel free to follow us on Twitter at Drive In Podcast. Check out our Patreon, patreon.com slash Revenge of the Drive In. There you'll find commentary tracks and other random shit, uh, early access to episodes. That is, if you still want to listen to us after hearing us talk about spookies. So <laughs> have a great spooky day, I guess. Make your day more spooky by not watching spookies. How about that? That's a good one. I like that. Let's, let's leave it at that.